And I'd like you all to please welcome Gavin Ivester. Thanks for coming up. Tom, I wish you had not said that. But I will wow you with an interesting fact, which is that if everybody paid $10, and there are eight speakers. I owe you about a dollar twenty-five worth of presentation tonight. So, so strap on your seatbelt. I'm going to go fast and try to give you a dollar fifty. Let's see what we got. So Tom said, "Yeah, come to this thing, fill in for Mark, and tell a little bit about where you came from, what you're working on, and uh, uh, what you sort of see in the future." So that's what it's going to be. And. Uh, you know, originally booked in this slot was Mark Montgomery, so the first thing I wanted to do is, uh, is give you that. Uh, <laughs> enough said? Here we go. Here's where it gets fast. So, I was born in California in Silicon Valley. It makes me a California kid. And that means I grew up racing BMX and uh, skateboarding. And you're going to see sort of the theme through this whole thing is sort of logical progressions, big, big achievements that I'm really proud of, and lessons that I learned along the way and hopefully applied. So skateboarding leads to trouble, right? So there we go. Punk rock. And that was my life. So skateboarding, BMX, punk rock. Um, and of course, you know, popped out of high school and got a dead-end job in a warehouse driving a forklift. Um, and that's where one of my first big, big achievements comes, is that these forklifts were incredibly hard to drive. They had the worst user interface of any device, I think, ever known to man, and I mastered that thing. Um, the interesting thing was, though, I was doing that at a company that was known for really good user interface, and, uh, and so I was working at Apple. Logical progression. I was also playing in a punk rock band. Um, put out an album. And, uh, so I was in two of the 47 bands on this record. Don't ask me why. Interesting outcome, though. So I'm still working at Apple, and I get an FBI record for some of the lyrics on, uh, on that album. Um, I didn't write that part, uh, just in case any of you are Secret Service or anything. Um, and that all explains why the next band I was in looks like this, and actually it was a pop band, which leads to one of my most proud achievements, which is that we sold a bar completely out of beer playing original music. So I'm still working at Apple. I become a design guy. Uh, went to school, got my degree in industrial design, designed a power book, uh, and explored the future of computing with a bunch of really interesting projects. Um, did some high profile stuff, designed the Newton. And at the ripe old age of 29, I realized I was going to be a lifer if I didn't move on. So I plotted and I, uh, and I left Apple after 11 years and, uh, and started my own business. And my goals were to find out what that was like to run my own business, and broaden my portfolio in terms of design. So I achieved those goals. My company was called Tonic, did it for five years, built a little group, had a blast, did some helmets, did some sunglasses. We're going to come back to those. Um, achieved all my goals, got recruited by Nike, moved up to Portland. Um, I was uh, the global, I don't even remember my title, was global head of footwear design. Never had designed a shoe. Um, and Nike was very gracious. They sent me all around the world to learn shoe business, which is a job that requires a ton of, a ton of travel. Um, did that for four years. Met my lovely wife, who's in the back, I just heard. So, um, and uh, moved on to a, a bigger job in a smaller company. Um, and and really began a seven-year transformation from design guy to business guy. And learned so much in this job. Um, my job title never changed. I was general manager of the footwear division, so I was sort of the guy. Um, and, uh, and my responsibility was to take a relatively small footwear business and turn it into a big one. Um, 
the interesting thing was I got to play designer at the same time, and this is where one of my sort of valuable life lessons or business lessons came from, is that I was sort of the creative director of uh, sunglasses, so we're back to those, and watches, which is a category of product that I love dearly. And, uh, and what I realized partway through that business was, uh, through that experience, was that in terms of revenue, those two smaller accessory divisions were, uh, they were license deals, and so they were worth, they were about 100 to $150 million businesses, and in terms of royalty, which was the actual income coming into Puma, they were worth about $15 million each. Meanwhile, that footwear business had grown from a couple hundred million dollars to two billion, and the lesson I learned, or the observation I had, was that, uh, you know, the, the watch and the eyewear business were being done by outsiders who were not Puma employees and didn't have half the interest in the success of the company that we had. Of course, they wanted to sell product, but they didn't have the sort of vested interest. But consumers really don't care whether, you know, one product line is coming from inside the company or another product line is licensed to outsiders. Nobody really notices that it's coming from two different sources. And so what I realized is that $30 million worth of revenue had the ability to potentially do real damage to $2 billion worth of revenue if we got it wrong in watches and eyewear. So my wife and I had kids. I wanted to get off the road. We moved to Nashville. <laughs> that was her. Uh, <laughs> we moved to Nashville, less said the better. Um, and I wound up working at Under Armour a little, for a little while, and then uh, fell in with Mark Montgomery and three other crazies, and we started Flow. Um, and that is where I had the opportunity to meet Nashville's greatest brand manager, Kenny Chesney. So, so why is Kenny Chesney Nashville's greatest brand manager? Well. This is how Kenny looked. Uh, it was years before I met him. Um, Kenny was Kenny had a solid country music career. He was putting out albums and traveling around the country in a bus, and he was in the music business. Um, and his mentors saw more potential in Kenny uh, and gave him some advice. They said, "You gotta really stand out from the crowd. You need to dig deep. You need to find what you're about, and you need to really bring that to the surface." And Kenny transformed himself. The guy knows how to work. Um, Kenny turned himself into the country singer on the beach. Uh, the linen pants, the, the guns, the tan, the, uh, the tank top, the ripped off sleeves, the straw cap, or hat, uh, sorry. Um, that didn't sound very authentic. Uh, that whole image and the repertoire that he puts with it, where you know he's really singing about summertime and good times on the beach and the water, etc., um, was a very deliberate effort at which Kenny works very, very hard. And so coming into that, you know, I realized the other thing about Kenny is he's obsessed with the music. He doesn't care about anything more than that. And that's where this lesson learned at Puma really applied. We knew that any business we would start with Kenny had that ability to damage the bigger brand that was way more important to him, which was his brand that he was using to put butts in seats and play music to. So, uh, so this is sort of what I'm working on now as we build artist brands. Um, we built Blue Chair Bay Rum from scratch, brand, product, complete team, operations, uh, a lot of it outsourced, a lot of it in, a lot of it us, and we've since hired employees and moved on. Um, and I'm proud to say, here's another big achievement, we hold the, uh, the world's record for first year sales for a startup spirits brand ever in the history of liquor. So, and a lot of the credit for that goes to Kenny because he already had built a great brand. So we built that brand out with all the brand stuff that you do. And here's where I want to pause for one second and just kind of look back. Now, I've worked at a lot of really great visible brands, and what I've noticed is that they all have uh, two things in common. They stand for something, and they use great design. So going back to Kenny, and I think Kenny is, uh, 
Kenny's a great example for a lot of artists in this town when they're really getting it right. He stands for something. Everybody knows what he represents, and it's not just Kenny singing a song. It's Kenny singing a song and the bigger idea of summertime. And who doesn't like that? Um, what I would love to see more of, and this is the part where we talk about what do I see coming down the pike next, is great design in Nashville, up and down Music Row. Um, and it's not like it hasn't happened before, right, in music. So let's think about some iconic logos over time. So powerful, so timeless. Everybody, if I told you the next one, well, maybe not the next one, maybe. Uh, you could probably sketch it before I show it to you. And I, you could definitely sketch the next one if I told you what it was. And we won't do it tonight, but it's KISS. <laughs> So, so this is sort of my personal mission. Um, at Flow, we're doing all kinds of things. We're, we're scaring up data to align audiences with artists and uh, brand partners and applying incredible science to do all that. Um, but the design piece is really important as well. So I'm gonna close with sort of an example of some recent work that we did with Jake Owen. He came to us at a really interesting time. He was just realizing that, uh, that it's okay that he didn't grow up five miles down a red dirt road um, and you know on a farm he's a he's a kid from the suburb suburbs of florida and grew up on the beach and on a boat um, but you know when you look back at how jake had been imaged uh, you know there was not a lot of his own personality coming through and so we worked with jake to really help him focus how he's imaged out in in, you know, all the ways in which artists are visible these days. And we also developed an identity for also about, he's kind of a summertime guy as well. He's, uh, he's about being on the lake, on a boat, on the ocean, Florida, good times with family and friends. And so we developed a brand that reflects that. It's a designed version of his autograph that also puts sort of a wakeboard wake into it. There's a, whoops, I pressed the wrong button. There's a, there's a secondary identity. Uh, we showed how it applies on product, and then we developed an entire uh, identity system around that. And so that's where I'm gonna leave you. Um, that's, you know, sort of the, the mission is to help artists really be real and be well-designed so they can be real good. Thanks.